In this video, we're circling back on the Poncade project. It's been a while, but we'll be circling back, assembling that circuit board, writing that software to bring this project to life. Stick around. Welcome back. In this video, we're following up on the Poncade desktop project. Now, in the previous videos you saw, I did, went through the ECAD, the MCAD, all that design work, and then we worked on milling all the parts. And in this video, we'll be assembling the circuit boards and writing the software to bring this thing to life. But before that, take a moment to support the channel, go down into that description and click on the Altium Designer link. They support these videos and I'd appreciate it if you can at least check out what you're missing in Altium Designer. Now, let's get started. All right, so it's been a while, so where were we with this project? We went through the design process, we designed all the parts, we milled all the parts, we 3D printed all the parts necessary. We had the ECAD in place, and we were waiting for these guys. These are the circuit boards that house the ESP8266, among other uh, components of the system. We're also waiting on tap plastics. Now this is the LED acrylic that I was waiting for. Turns out it didn't really look that great, and we uh, ended up going with the acrylic with a white diffuser just a smoked acrylic and we'll see how that turns out a little bit later in the project when we assemble it but for now let's get this circuit board put together all right so on the circuit board there wasn't a lot of components to start out i tried this chip quick paste to solder on the 0805 resistors uh, and just using my hot air rework gun um, and a set of tweezers to place them it worked okay. Uh, in the end, I, I think I switched over to my soldering iron just to place them manually with solder. Um, but like I said, there's just a few surface mount chips here. Soldering iron was easier than using chip quick um, as this board was too large to fit in my uh, reflow oven. I just placed all these individual chips. And most of these chips are uh, pull up resistors, pull down resistors, um, voltage dividers, not a lot of complexity on this board. The, to, the basic requirements to host the ESP8266 are minimal. There you see that pen I'm using, which is a, a Rosen pen, which is kind of nice, but it wasn't very clean um, compared to some of the other flux that I use. Uh, it's convenient in it's uh, a pen that um, dispenses Rosen or flux, uh, but it was a messy flux that w left a pretty bad residue on the, the surface of the PCB. So ultimately I didn't use that very much, although it was something I was trying out. Um, uh, since then, I've actually replaced the soldering iron. The soldering iron has fume extraction, which is pretty nice. I didn't have to have a separate fume extractor. I did upgrade my soldering station. Uh, the thing about using these fine point tips is they don't hold the heat very well. So often you have to really crank up the heat in order to get it to uh, get to a good temperature that you can flow at that size if you're just using the, the tip of the, the soldering iron. Not a big deal. Use a little bit of the microscope to capture some of this work. Um, video quality isn't great, but it's it's maybe useful to see uh, the actual soldering and the level of detail that we're working on. So this is using the soldering paste and hot air rework gun. couple of capacitors there and you see the hot air gun just has a little too much pressure to do these uh, 0805s it blows them around so you have to be really careful it makes a mess ultimately you have to come back and clean it up with uh, some IPA um, so here switching over to the soldering iron just doing a, a better job on these discrete uh, resistors and capacitors Uh, typically, I'll just use solder paste and a stencil and, and a reflow oven. This board was about a, a 12 inches wide, which is bigger than my current reflow oven. I'm looking at getting a larger one, but I need a, a, a better project or a bigger project. 
uh, with higher volume to justify that expense. So for now, this was done by hand. You can see that IC3 slot, which is where the uh, 4051 multiplexer goes in. But before that, I'm dropping in a couple resistors here. And these are just, uh, leave a pull down resistor. Pull down resistor for the A0 line that goes into the ESP8266. These are uh, some pull up resistors and a reset switch there to reboot the machine should you need to. This is uh, R3 and R4, the voltage divider there that supply current to the sliders um, for the A0 read. And R567 are pull down resistors for different lines on the ESP8266. Here's the 4051 multiplexer, just through hole pins, just soldering this up. N nothing big here. I mean, 16 pin uh, chip there. I just wanted to trim it down because that is on the bottom side of the board and on the top side we have those LED matrixes that need to only have about a, a millimeter and a half clearance. So hitting it with some IPA, cleaning it up, getting all of that excess flux off the board, soldering up the sliders, now these are dual linear sliders. Uh, we had an extra channel on there. You only need a sing single channel, but on these 10K dual linears, it's, it seems that that's the standard um, that's available through Amazon. Obviously you can go get more specific. Here's the DF player, which is also through hole, I believe a 16 pin as well. It's just a wider form factor. Soldering that up as well as uh, trimming it down trim it down those legs so that they don't interfere with the LED. Now at some point maybe this board will be redesigned and just have all of the 5050 uh, LEDs or smaller uh, dot star type LEDs uh, incorporated into this but it was cheaper just to buy the uh, LED matrixes from Amazon. Uh, they come in 8x8 matrix and they're uh, making a total of 8x24 wide and it was easier than placing all of those LEDs. Again, uh, hitting this with some IPA, clean up the extra flux, and then some uh, Kimtech wipes to get rid of the excess. I have an ultrasonic cleaner, and I use that in some cases, uh, but not here. Then, before we put the ESP8266 on there, I'm just checking the regulator, the step down regulator from 5 volt to 3.3 and confirming um, on a couple test points uh, that it's, it's properly regulating the power. Then to solder the 8266, just manually uh, tacking it down um, with the iron and then coming back and getting good bonds in each of those pins and those connectors. This has the castellated holes on the side of the chip. Now this isn't a node MCU or anything like that. This is just the raw ESP8266 module. Um, I think this is a 12F. Okay, once that module is mounted, we step over to the, the three different matrix next to each other. Now since there's a minimal clearance, I had to uh, route these wires um, to put these panels in series so that all the wires were flat against there because I could go the thickness of those wires but not much more and if they were bundled it would cause problems with clearance so just routed them so that they lay down perfectly flat uh, into the next panel in series had to do that twice to connect all three of those in series just stripping them tinning them off the edge there and then tinning the pads individually soldering them on there or soldering routing them flat so that they're not bound up or multiplying the height of the wire 
not a big deal. Obviously could have designed it to have more clearance, but didn't need to. So just being a little diligent about uh, keeping things flat. And then obviously using the capped on tape to hold things together in terms of these panels and the wires. Uh, eventually I would put capped on tape over those wires to hold them in place. Then once they were in place, um, it's time to solder up that RGB matrix to the, or marry it up to the uh, circuit board. And that as well, those wires just need to be flat. So soldering them up individually to the corresponding wires. Although I have through holes, I'm just using mass pads. It would be nice to design some uh, flexible flat cables for this sort of project, but this worked fine. Now getting the board in place and gluing that speaker and the, the two buttons that were installed on the back of the enclosure was just a little bit tedious, but just kind of finesse it down into place. And then take that over to the table. Before we get too far, electronic projects always start with good circuit designs. And for that, I rely on Altium Designer. From simple to complex, if you haven't taken a chance to download a free copy and see what you're missing, I've put links in the description. And with Altium Designer, creating these complex projects is a piece of cake. Through your development, you'll be empowered to do your best work as you grow into its more advanced capabilities. The link in the description below will allow you a free trial version of the software so that you can check it out and see what Enterprise Class ECAD feels like. Now back to the overview. So with the electronics complete, it was time to laser cut that acrylic face. Now, like I said, originally I wanted to go with the Tap Plastics LED acrylic. It has a neat matte finish and it's almost uh, weird how it's able to have good transmission rate, but it just made things look blurry. And with this clear acrylic, I would use that along with a 0.5 millimeter, uh, I think it's a HIPS uh, polystyrene. Uh, to use it as a diffusing layer underneath that acrylic. And so I minimally cut this out because it shrinks and melts really easily. So I minimally laser cut that. And that's going to go down on top of that matrix as a diffuser. But first we need to mount that circuit board matrix in by putting the M3 screws through the board into the body. Um, there's four on this particular design and through the aluminum body there. Once that's complete, then we just lay in that white 0.5 millimeter diffuser through the sliders and then put that clear smoke acrylic on top of it. And it seats down in just through a compression fit. Now with the knobs on there, you can see the finish and fit and finish on this is really nice and complete. Um, it's just got the two buttons on the back and the power supply and the speaker on the bottom. With that, let's finish it off with some feet to elevate the speaker and give it some room so that we can hear what the heck's going on here. And that's about it. Now it's time to put some software. All right, with the circuit board in place and the final assembly complete, it's time to head over to the computer and let's talk about the software, the development and the considerations that went into the design of that program that would ultimately be uploaded to the ESP8266. For that, we'll need to hop over to the computer and look at the code in the Arduino IDE. Okay, so diving into the Arduino IDE, we're gonna step through this code and I'll explain some of the reasoning and logic as to how I developed this and uh, what requirements were necessary to, to accomplish um, the intended solution. So this is a Pong arcade solution using the LED matrix. So at the top of the solutions, we're obviously where all the includes are, and that includes things like, uh, pardon the pun, ESP8266 Wi-Fi, the DNS, UDP, and the Arduino OTA, which is over the air update. So the intention of this design, it doesn't have a USB controller. So leveraging the wi wireless capabilities of the 8266 uh, CPU would be to leverage uh, Arduino o over the air updates. And that allows me to push new versions of the firmware without having to connect to a USB uh, and just simplify all of that activity. So those libraries are for that. Fast LED is a, I'm sure you're aware of it, if, but if you're not, Fast LED is a high performance library to interact and communicate and control uh, the LED uh, modules on uh, LED strips. So WS2812 and variations, ASA, uh, dot star, 
you name it, all the different types of LED chips, fast LED can control them. That's very efficient about doing that and it makes it easy to work with them. Uh, also in this project is a DF Robot uh, DF player, which is an MP3 player that has a micro SD card that you can put MP3s on and then you can play them at your discretion throughout the logic of the code. That makes it easy to add sound. Um, it has a built-in audio amplifier for, I believe, up to two watt speaker. So for something like this, it's perfect. Uh, finite state machine. Now that's uh, a library that helps you in defining the states of the, the device that you're creating. So in Arduino, typically you have a setup method function that will allow you to initialize all of your components. You have a loop function that will iterate as fast as it can to execute the code. And that's the limitation of the organization. Everything beyond that is up to your, your ability to abstract and compartmentalize your logic. Now, the easiest, now you can do that if you're uh, proficient, if you're uh, experienced in writing C code, then you can leverage all of the constructs of that uh, syntax and, and uh, language to elegantly um, design your software or you can use something like a finite state machine which is going to basically give you an enter an update and an exit function for every state that your machine will be in for example in this particular project when we're in an attract mode obviously when I enter the attract mode there's some initialization that needs to occur and then the update in the attract mode will perform its logic and then when I leave the attract mode to go into say gameplay mode then you'll have an exit function that will be able to clean up any stuff that needs to be you know, housekeeping for the, the project. So keep that in mind for all of these states. The finite state machine is going to simplify all that and you'll see that uh, X implemented uh, below. In addition to that, I use a few other libraries that are designed for fast LED and I'll, I'll leave links to all of these uh, libraries and in the description below. Uh, LED matrix. LED sprites and LED text. Now all of these work against the fast LED library. So LED matrix allow, allows you to create a, a matrix of LEDs uh, and manage it simplistically um, leveraging this library. LED sprites on the other hand allows you to define sprites and work with those. If you're familiar with old like Commodore 64 and things like that where you could define multicolor sprites and you can detect collisions and you can uh, automate the movement of them you know, this library does all that for you. So obviously you could write an a declarative or an imperative sort of implementation of Pong to where it's X and Y. And if X is greater than this and the boundaries of your matrix, then, you know, rebound and inverse the direction and things like that. But sprites allows you to uh, do it in a declarative way in that you can define your sprites, uh, give them motion properties and then let the LED sprite library manage all of the collisions and everything else um, that you like and it allows you gives you the flexibility to change the shape of the paddles change the shape of the ball at any time without having to change any of your code or logic so it's kind of nice and it's really neat and we'll show you how that gets implemented LED text is uh, you know it has different fonts and allows you to script the uh, color schema of the text that you want to display or scroll across your matrix and it just makes it really easy to automate and make some really custom stuff so you want to check that out as well and we'll, we'll show how that gets implemented the font matrice is a font that i'm used in using in this software and that just the particular font um, there are multiple fonts available like robotron and uh, you know several others or you can define your own and then the simple kalman filter is basically a kalman filter um, uh, with a simple implementation and a Kalman filter is good at normalizing or predicting a value when you have a stochastic or you know there's a lot of error in the signal and the reason why I'm using that in this is that I'm using slide pots and slide pots are basically being read through an analog pin on the ESP8266 and when it does that you know you're reading the resistance of that pin now there's a couple of uh, you know ways that you could correct for the error that, that that reading will have when you're reading from an analog pig, such as you know adding a simple capacitor to your line in so that it will buffer uh, any change or ripple in the value coming out of the slide pot, or you can use a, a Kalman filter. And what that does is it takes the current value and it takes the the new value and it'll predict where it should be. 
So it simplifies by removing a lot of the error from your signal. Really useful, the low overhead, so that's included here. Next, we uh, you know define the matrix, and this is uh, what pin am I going to use to com communicate with all of those LEDs. It's a GRB color order. The chip set is WS2812Bs. 20, the matrix only 24 pixels wide, 8 pixels high, and it's a vertical matrix, which is the orientation, which determines the how the LEDs are linked to one another. Now you can see there's a couple other tabs up here. I'm not going to go into those. Um, Pongcade H is where I keep secrets for my uh, SSID and the password for that. You can change it to whatever yours is. And tone pitches. This board has a, the ability to add a piezo buzzer on there. Uh, and pitches just defines a couple of the uh, frequencies so that you can just refer to them as their nodes. Um, that's pretty much all that's going on there. Um, and so from the, the secrets or the H uh, file, we pull out the SSID and the, the password for uh, the WPA2 connection. And that'll, that's for the 8266 to connect your Wi-Fi. You'll need to change that to yours if you, if you choose that. The slider variable. So these are things like the slider pin is on AO. And while the, the uh, slider pin, um, there's only one analog input on this that's that's ultimately what we use the 4051 multiplexer for is to switch which slider we're reading and they both come in through a zero um, and you'll see how that's done a little bit later also have an array of integers for the slider value and that's basically the position and you'll see how we read that in now these are um, this is actually zero to five not zero to eight because there's really ultimately only five positions that the paddles can be in. There's uh, eight pixels high and it's three pixels tall, so it can move around five different pixels. Uh, implementing or initializing the Kalman filter is just using uh, the default values here for the, the amount of, uh, to control the estimation and you can, you can tweak and tune that to improve it for your particular application. And then uh, we define some of the states. So for this particular gameplay, there's three different states. So there's game attract. And when we set up that state, we can define uh, the functions that will need to be called when you enter that state. Game attract enters the name of the function that it'll that will be called when we're going into the attract mode. Game attract update is what will be executed every time there's a loop cycle. And in this case, there's no exit. There's nothing to clean up, so I'm just passing null. But if I wanted to uh, a function to perform cleanup work after we're leaving that state, then I can add that here. Uh, game play, which is um, when the ball's in play on the court and the paddles are moving, we have a game play enter. So we need to set up those sprites, put them in the game play field, uh, and then during game play cycles, uh, every loop iteration, We'll do a play update and that will check for collisions, move things around uh, and make sounds and adjust player scores and things like that. Uh, in, in the particular use case of this project, um, when a player scores, then it exits and goes into a player score mode. So when it exits, then it's time to clean up the sprites uh, and adjust any other variables that need to. And finally, there's a player score mode. So this is what displays the player score it hides all the sprites, does all that stuff. And so this also has uh, two functions. We have player score enter, which allows me to set up the environment, set up the fonts, set up the text that will be on the screen, uh, color it accordingly, you know, green for the winning player, red for the losing player, uh, and then call a loop while it scrolls that text onto the screen. And when it exits, uh, there's, there's nothing else necessary there, so we don't need a function for that. So these are the three different states that will be used in the game, and you'll see how that works. Now, finally, um, to use those states, we instance the finite state machine uh, in this variable called state machine, and then we tell it what the default state machine is. In this case, we'll be um, starting the game in attract mode, and so that's what passing the state game attract into it is doing. And so uh, the state machine is responsible for saying, hey, uh, you want me to start in game of track, so I'll need to first go into the enter state to prepare everything and then loop in the update. And you'll see how that works a little bit, a little bit later. 
finally we have some uh some gameplay the player scores is uh you know a two value array here uh, just to keep track pong is a simple scoring system in this case we play to 10 and whoever wins is gets the 10 first is the winner um, and since we're bouncing in and out of gameplay and score um, then uh, when you when a person scores then this is just a placeholder to understand you know what was the last um, balls X change which is basically which direction was it headed uh, in this case we're starting out with one which is to the right and then whether or not this is the gameplay's first loop so in the gameplay mode when we're returning the score this just allows me to uh, pause for a minute so that the players can see the ball and prepare for it before it just it starts sending it there's, now there's not a lot of pixels on this and if it just sends it it's very difficult to react as quick as you need to and so in this case um, by having this flag it allows the loop to know hey this is the first time uh, you know resuming gameplay and so we want to pause and give the player a chance so that they can see the ball and um, prepare their paddle and, and whatnot so we'll see how that that um, helps below the screen message uh, now for the attract mode uh, now this is using that LED text library and so in order to do that we create this LED text object and then we can um, set the text. Now this has its own syntax and capabilities that are um, pretty broadly documented on his uh, GitHub. So you can check that out. I'll leave a link to that, obviously. But this is just a character array, unsigned character array, and with lots of enumerations, which which help that library to parse what you how you want to format and manipulate the text so in this case we're setting the frame rate because we don't want it to be too fast to uh, to five and then we can tell it to leave the background or overwrite the background in this case we're leaving it so we're we're gonna scroll this on top of whatever's already there we're scrolling up and the actual text is just this pong um, I can only get like four on this matrix it's pretty low resolution you can only get four letters across so then what you see here is this is a blank line and then the text and then another blank line. So when it's scrolling up, you'll see it enter off the bottom of the screen and scroll off the top of the screen. And in this case, uh, this is a delay frame. So this passes in a value that tells the text processing system to scroll it, but then stop and pause for a moment. Now the text score on the other hand, so that's for the text to track. The text score on the other hand is just a 25, um, length uh, unsigned character array and that's dynamically generated based on the scores later on in the system uh, when it's preparing to uh, display the scores it will calculate that and and then display it on the screen we'll see how that comes together down below now the led matrix using the library above is going to pass in the width the height the type and just and set it in this variable called leds uh, the mini player or the df player mini is just creating an instance of that library now in this case we have a target frame rate so this is uh, you know how many frames uh, do I want to generate per second um, actually that's not correct the target frame rate in this case is defined as milliseconds and so this is going to be the number of milliseconds to pause between each loop cycle and it'll do its best to have a 40 millisecond frame rate um, and if it can't, it'll just do its best as fast as the processor will allow. And this can be adjusted and tweaked. Now in this particular game, the target frame rate is just the starting frame rate. And then I use um, some variables here, which are the first loop milliseconds, to uh, calculate and speed up the game over time. So the more successful paddle hits and volleys you get during the game will cause this to reduce until it's a lightning fast speed and very difficult to cognitively respond to the gameplay and so it is does have a dynamic speed but it starts out at 40. now in this particular game to uh, spice things up a little bit we've got plasma that's being generated at a dim level in the background and so to allow that plasma to morph and shift over time we've got a couple of variables to support that so plasma time plasma shift now this is uh, constant in the background of the game. It's very, it's at about 25% uh, 
uh, illumination so it's very dim but you can see it it's noticeable it's a rainbow plasma uh, and then on top of that overlaid are the paddles and the ball and the any text that's being displayed now uh, to use the sprites now here's where it gets interesting uh, you basically just have to define the sprites and keep in mind we haven't even got to initialization this is just all variable declaration and um, library instancing so we're still working through setting up all the variables and libraries um, to get ready for gameplay so the ball data um, this is just a one bit one pixel ball that's all we're using here and so the ball data is is just one simple definition of a one bit uh, and now if you look at the documentation for the led sprite library uh, there's lots of capabilities and you can use multiple colors and you can have uh, color structures that will um, you know give you full 256 colors or whatever you need to and your sprites can be as big as as you want them to be in addition to the the data for the sprite definition you can create masks so that you can make only certain objects uh, able to be uh, you know collided with other uh, sprites and it's very complex and complicated but sprite, uh, pong is a very simple game in this case we've just got a one bit one color ball sprite and that's what you're seeing here uh, and then the paddle data these are a one bit of three pixel high paddle and so it just represents a three pixel paddle this game is very simple low resolution it doesn't need complexities but you could change the height by adding a fourth um, bit here as well we don't need this follow -up trailing comma here either so um, keep in mind um, this is just scraping the surface on what we want to do if I if I wanted to make this a, a larger uh, ball then I could just change the definition of the sprite and then everything would subsequently um, work the same way uh, and so leaving some of those options maybe down the road or if you want to customize this and modifying those sprites you could make it a pac-man and a ghost or something you know if you want to play pong with ghosts or you know a galaxian character instead of a ball so lots of different uh, flexibility using the sprite library not a lot of overhead and it really simplifies the, the logic um, to a large degree now when uh, to use those sprites this is a one bit sprite which means they're only going to be one color you'll need uh, an individual color and so for the the paddles i'm using this color table one which is just white so the paddles are just white 250 it's a rgb crgb uh, object and then for the ball this is yellow so it's uh, what blue or red and green uh, 255 and no blue which will give us a yellow color and we'll use those as we define the sprites so uh, to define the sprites we first uh, instance up that library pass in the LED in a reference to the LEDs and then we create the individual sprites sprite ball which is a one comma one sprite using this ball data uh, one bit using the color table and the ball data again as the mask now if the mask differed from the sprite then you could define that differently and pass it in as well and the, for, for the sprites we're one pixel wide three pixels high using the paddle data <coughs> and color table one instead of color table two and using again the paddle data as the the mask and so the mask is what's used when we compare masks or when the library compares masks to determine if there's a collision when two objects are moving um, over one another so you don't have to worry about understanding all of that uh, you can dive into those libraries if you're interested um, but the mask is just uh, so you can selectively determine what a collision means uh, using that library and then finally we have a flag for over the air update mode uh, and that's set to false by default now the reason why I set a, this as a flag is because I want to um, do my best to isolate the over the air update from the gameplay so that if I write some terrible code that crashes then um, I can still get to an over the air update and not have to worry about uh, you, you know um, extracting the chip and programming it off board um, I can be ensured that as much as possible OTA will be available to resolve this issue and it's just using the 8266 and so how we get into the OTA mode you'll see during the setup so the default Arduino setup 
is then run. And so what we use that for? Basically to set up pins. So uh, in, the, in the setup function itself, we set up a couple target frame rates, um, delay loops, and then we set some pin modes. So these are the, the pins for the piezo that set up as output, the pins for the LED set up as output, and then to use the multiplexer, uh, the multiplexer requires one to three pins to determine the to determine which analog object we want to read from. So the multiplexer is overkill for the solution. It can support eight analog devices, and in which case you would use all three lines to determine you know which analog device you want to read and it'll send it out to a common output on that 4051 chip. Now, in our case, that common output is going to our A0 analog input because the 8266 only has a single analog input, ADC. ADC being analog digital converter, um, FYI. <laughs> All right, so in our case, we only need to, well, we really only need to read two different analog signals, but since these sliders are stereo, I want to um, set it up so that I could um, switch. So I'm reading four different uh, signals here. So using the two pins to select which input I want to um, channel to the common output on the 4051, um, these two pins as output allow me to do that. Updating the slider values uh, is a function below that will read those pins and we'll see what that looks like in a second. In addition to the A and B lines, we have a couple pins for start and select. Now, the basic functionality on this device only requires one button to start and the second button for now is used as, um, you know, to go into OTA mode. And for that to work, uh, we've got the separate buttons, but ultimately I may change the logic and implement different gameplays or different games and uh, just have those pins available for that. So when this device is powering up and this setup is running, the setup function is running, um, which is only ran once the first time the device is powered up, if I'm holding the start button, then it will default to an OTA mode. An OTA mode is only going to run over the air update. It doesn't run anything that's going to distract or could potentially crash. And so it's only going to run OTA. So if I'm holding the start button when setup is initializing, uh, we'll set up the Wi-Fi. We'll begin the Wi-Fi. We'll connect to the OTA. Uh, we'll define what the host name is. So in Arduino IDE, if you're pushing data, then you'll see this Pong OTA at uh, some IP address, whatever IP address is assigned to your device. Uh, then you can you can improve the password. You can add a password or things like that if you don't want people to you know, inadvertently connect to things that they shouldn't. And then there are a few, I guess, uh, inline functions here for the OTA library, which are called uh, on start when the firmware download begins. You can perform some activities. When it ends, you can perform other activities on the progress, on the error. So these are all inline or, you know, abstract functions that are being implemented for support of the OTA. And then we call OTA begin. So calling that OTA begin is a process that starts the OTA process to advertise its endpoint, connect to the Wi-Fi and all of that fun stuff. So all of that's performed if you're holding down the start button. Uh, if you're not, then we don't want that overhead. We don't want OTA. We want a high frame rate, a gameplay. So we, we do not initialize all of that and tell it to begin. So Continuing in the setup, we finish off with a couple of variables such as the plasma shift and plasma time. Now this is for the background generation. And then we uh, set up the serial port um, and the serial ports used for the DF player. We tell that to begin, we set the volume to 25 and then we initialize fast LED, set the brightness, clear it, clear the screen and then tell it to begin to display the the cleared buffer. That's everything that's done in the setup. So in setup, uh, you're initializing everything, you're 
starting the processes that are necessary. You're going into OTA mode if you're holding the button down and you're you know, conditionally preparing the fast LED and DF player. Now in the loop, typically is where you would do all the logic, but because we're using a finite state machine and uh, OTA flag, we're not doing a lot of anything. So we're just checking to see if, if it should be in OTA mode. And if it is, then all we're gonna do is handle the OTA requests, the advertisement, the processing of data. That makes OTA really quick. It's not gonna do much for the experience because when you're in OTA mode, it's just in a headless um, update mode. And so that's the point of this. And if it's not in OTA mode, then we're just telling the state machine, hey, update whatever you need to do, whatever you gotta do. So if it's changing states from one state to another, and you'll see how we do that a little bit later, then it will call that. And it'll call the enter, it'll call the update, it'll call the exit, it'll functions, whichever it needs to call, it's gonna call it when it does its update here. Now, because we told the state machine to start in a track mode, it's automatically knows that the first update is gonna be calling a tracked enter, right? And so now let's look at, uh, you know, those different state definitions. So for each of the state definitions, I mentioned that there's an enter, there's an update, and in some cases there's an exit. So this, um, the attract mode only has an enter and update. So when it's starting the attract mode, it's gonna call this once. You can think of it as the setup for that, uh, that state. And in this case, we're setting the font, we're setting, basically initializing the screen message. Because in our attract mode, all it does is scroll the word Pong and generate some background. And so once we set up the text using the text attract that was defined above, and the color options, and we tell it to play a sound, so it's gonna say Pong, and then it's gonna set the target frame rate. It's gonna exit that, that enter um, function. And then forever, from that point on, it's just gonna call this game attract update. This is the new loop for the attract uh, finite state. And when it's in attract mode, this is the, uh, the only processing that's going to be performed and it'll keep doing that forever now you may be asking how do you get out of that how do how does the state change and we'll we'll see that just below um, so when it's looping uh, we're checking the frame time and so if if it's time to generate a new frame then we're going to process this logic but if it's not we're not going to waste our time we're not, we're, and, and this allows us to have a steady controllable frame rate so if you see us reading milliseconds and what the what the time was during the last loop you know it's not going to start that until it's greater than the target frame rate which in our case was 40 milliseconds so everything less than 40 milliseconds it's not going to do anything it's just going to leave 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 and then oh it's been 45 milliseconds now we're going to generate a frame so in this game attract update this is just controlling the the frame rates as they're generated last loop equals milliseconds. So this is updating that variable so that we know the last time this frame was generated was at this time. First thing we do is clear the screen and then we draw plasma. So in our case, plasma is just a simple routine or function that generates plasma based on the plasma time and the plasma shift variables to fill the background with plasma. And you may be wondering what plasma is. You'll see that in a little bit. Um, most people are familiar with that pattern. Uh, and this um, uses a HSV color set, so it just shifts, um, sort of looks like a fractal plasma. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a rainbow full color spectrum, and you'll see how that works a little bit later. Color plus plus. So color is a static function variable here that is going to you know, continually increment as it's running this attract update. And the way that that's used is ultimately to generate uh, the color for the Pong name. And in, in this case, you can see that this set text color options, it's setting the color of the screen message. In this case, it's a HSV, it's a vertical gradient. And so I just need two colors. This is the first color, this is the second color, and it'll generate a gradient across that text. So this is one of the powerful aspects of that library. You can make gradient text without having to explicitly define it. 
you just tell it the gradient colors and it'll automatically generate everything there. And so I'm using this color value um, using the modulus 255 because that's the max value that as this increments, you'll see it cycle 0 through 255. And then the complementary color, which would be color plus 128 on the hue spectrum, um, percent 255, so the modulus there as well. And then the saturation and value 255, so they're just high color, right? High saturation and brightness. So that's all that we need to automatically mutate the colors of the gradient on the, the Pong text that's scrolling up the screen. Now, in addition to that, we uh, then draw the text, and as it's moving it, uh, the library will, will tell us, after it updates the position of the text, um, it'll set it to negative one if it's finished the movement as defined by the, the screen message text. And when it's finished, you can reset it. In this case, this is setting it uh, to the beginning. Uh, and so this will just cause it to loop. But since our text has a delay at the end, you know, it's going to delay, and then it's going to loop again. Fast LED, calling Fast LED Show is just telling it to update it. Update the LED matrix with any changes that have occurred. Um, because we're updating the text and it's associated to the LED matrix, it automatically is drawing everything and the color and everything is all automatic. So this, sim this simplistic uh, implementation of scrolling text uh, with the evolving color and automatic looping, you know, five lines of code, which would, you know, those libraries are probably doing a couple hundred lines of code. And then finally, in the attract mode, we're just waiting for pin 15 to go high. And if pin 15 goes high, that means they're pressing the button and intending that they want to play. And so the first thing I do is play a sound. I'm going to play the sound um, that I've set up for gameplay. And then I'm going to tell the state machine to transition to gameplay. And by doing that, you're basically telling the, the state machine that you want to switch over to this new state. And the state machine is responsible for exiting the current state, entering the new state, and then iterating in the new state. So it's pretty simple. That's all it's going to do. So in our case, we tell it to go to gameplay, and it will automatically start using the next three functions, which are Gameplay enter, gameplay update, and gameplay exit. So the first thing called will be the gameplay enter. And the first thing that the stuff that's performed in the enter is updating the slider values, make sure that we know where the sliders are positioned, and then creating the sprites. And for the sprites, when we define them, we can uh, set the position frame motion options. And so these are things like, is it moving? You know, should it be moving? And if so, what's the rate of the movement? What is the change that should be applied at every rate interval? So in this case, you're, for every one frame, uh, uh, you're adding one to the Y, you know, and for every one frame, you're adding three to the, to the X and so on and so forth. So that you can manipulate and change the direction of the sprite and it's automatically processed by, by the, uh, LED sprite library. In this case, you can also pass in flags in that def motion definition. You can say, hey, detect the edge of the screen, detect if there's a collision with another sprite, and keep the, the sprite inside the Y boundaries, which are the vertical boundaries. So it'll automatically bounce and everything. It's going to automatically process that movement. I don't have to implement any of that logic because I'm telling it how to behave and the library's uh, managing the rest for me. Now for the paddles, they're, they're pretty dumb. They don't have any movement unless you explicitly move the slider. So everything's zero here. There's no automatic motion. There's no flags. Uh, we're already going to detect collisions, so we don't have to worry about that. And then to the sprite library, we just add those three sprites in the setup and we um, exit the, uh, the gameplay enter function. So once that's all been set up, then gameplay update will be called. And here's where we're doing the same thing. We're checking for it's greater than the loop delay milliseconds, which is that value that uh, speeds up over time. So the more successful volleys of the ball will cause this to be reduced. So it'll 
increase to like light near lightning speed uh, uh, in terms of the gameplay. Um, all we do in this library is first clear the screen, update the sprites, detect collisions, and then we check the flags for the ball to see if it's in a sprite collision state. And if it is, then we can successfully determine that first that if it's in a, a collision state with paddle one or paddle two, then ultimately we don't have to do anything. We just have to reverse the, re the direction. And so to do that, we'll, we'll capture a flag and then we'll set the X change um, to reverse it. So the last X ball change, we're just inverting it to minus get change. Uh, so that's gonna cause it to go in the opposite X direction. And then the loop delay milliseconds, that means that somebody successfully volleyed it. Um, and, and so the loop delay milliseconds, I wanna increase the speed um, slowly but surely. Uh, every modulus of two on milliseconds when this loop is executing will cause the loop delay to be deducted by one um, with a minimum of 10 milliseconds per loop. And so the, the modulus two just makes it a little bit more random or inconsistent because doing it every cycle of a frame that that in which the ball was volleyed, it sped up too quick. And so this um, reduces it um, significantly. And then we change the angle of the ball depending on the correlation of the ball to the paddle. So to do that, I basically determine that, you know, which which paddle is hitting the ball and I grab the Y value of that respective paddle. So paddle one Y value or paddle two Y value, it just depends on which one the ball hit. And then I subtract from that value, the, the ball's Y value. And that will give me an offset. Is it at the top of the paddle? Is it at the bottom of the paddle? And then the way I use that, um, since we're using a sprite motion library that automatically calculates everything, I really just need to tell it, you know, how much should the Y change as you continue to calculate the motion, automated motion for the sprite. In this case, I'm just using the delta value that I just this, uh, calculated up here. If it's less than zero, then I tell it to move in the positive direction. If it's greater than zero, then I tell it to move in the negative direction. And the Y counter is basically how aggressively of an, how, how much of an aggressive angle will it move? So if the, the Y counter was one, that would mean every frame of movement, um, I would apply this change. So if this change is positive one, and the counter is set to one, then it would go in a 45 degree angle. And so what this counter allows me to do is it says, hey, let's use that delta and then add some random variable so that it will not consistently um, be at 45 degree angles. And so this will put it out at a 60 or a 30 degrees, just depending on that random value that's added to the delta. Keep in mind that delta can be uh, positive or negative value so it can move in any angle any direction and increase the playability because we know we just hit something we're gonna play the sound that something was hit now if that's all that happens then we uh, that's all of the detection that's performed um, for a collision the ball hit something this is all of the logic that I do now if it didn't collide with something then that means that the ball went past the paddle and so then I check you know w get the flags for the ball did it hit the edge of the screen whether the min or the max so so if it hit the min then I know that player two scored and if it hit the max then I know that player one scored so I increase the respective score I play the miss sound and then we transition to the player score so if it hit the boundary of the screen, it will increase the player score, play the sound, and transition to player score. All right, so there's a little bit more logic down here, and this has to do with, um, you know, if this is the first iteration um, of going into the gameplay mode, this is where it pauses. We delay for a certain amount of time until this uh, loop delay milliseconds has completed. 
and it will do this process while um, it it's less than 750 milliseconds and so this is kind of the pause you know in prompt pause and then uh, when it exits whether a, when a player has scored then uh, gameplay exit will be called in which it trap it keeps track of the direction of the ball and removes the three sprites because just not to keep those in memory and sort of clean up house and so when when the players score uh, was increased and the state machine was told to transition to player score one it will call this gameplay exit and then we'll head into the player score state in this case player score enter where we will generate the text for the score um, using the player scores for values as we uh, leverage the capabilities of the sprintf functionality to swap out these um, placeholders in the string it's a little complicated you can look up documentation on sprintf and find out how the, all of this magic works um, basically it's conditionally determine the space between the two values and and generating uh, the text that will be displayed below now um, the reason why I have this conditional statement in uh, preparing the text is to determine what color the the score value should be so in this case I wanted to make the losing players score red and the winning players score green and so if the players uh, score one is greater than zero then it does red and green and if it's the opposite then it does green and red uh, just to color the uh, the text correctly once the scores um, have been prepared um, I play a sound so player one wins player two wins whatever that may be and then um, we exit that that enter function and then uh, this player score update is uh, function is called now when the player score update is called here's where we're again doing the, the frame rate we're generating plasma and we're moving the score across the screen um, and once the the score has moved up the screen it will determine you know was this a winning score and if so then let's go back into a track mode the game's over and if it's not a winning score then we're going back into gameplay mode um, there's there's still some balls to play so that said uh, once this is complete it's either gonna head into a track mode or into gameplay mode uh, and when it does that it will t return to the respective functions that we have already covered in exhaustive detail so hopefully this is uh, useful and you're understanding the logic and the implementation here of how these state machines work um, it's it's a little complex and to wrap your mind around but once you do it's much easier to manage the logic that's performed in a particular state of gameplay now beneath that concludes all of the state lot code logic that was implemented for those three states of attract mode gameplay mode and player score mode so the, the only three states that this device is ever performing beyond that we've got a couple helper methods one was update slider values you saw that called earlier it's really just setting the flags for the multiplexer those a and b values we'll put it a and b so if they're both low that's zero zero so it's going to read the first slider and when we uh, we give it a couple seconds just a couple milliseconds to settle and then we'll read the slider zero value uh, and we pass it into the Kalman filter here update the estimate the analog read of the slider pin divided by 204 now the analog input on a zero is a zero to one volt uh, value which is 0 to 1024. Now I only need five pixels of resolution so I want a number between 0 and 5 and for me to do that I just take that analog read value so 1024 divided by 5 is 204 and so I read in that analog slider pin value divided by 204 round it and that will give me my slider value of 0 through 5 um, and I'm just going to use that to determine where the paddle should be displayed on the screen. It's a low resolution, like I mentioned, eight pixels tall. So I'm only the slider's only controlling zero through five. 
by using this Kalman filter, you're not going to see any jitter. It's not going to jitter between pixels or anything like that because this is uh, discreetly telling you uh, an estimate based on the error in the signal that's being read, or in this case, the analog ADC value that's being read uh, to stabilize it, um, given the parameters, uh, and generate a stable, steady value. To read the second slider, uh, we just go low, high, which in this case is going to be um, input 2. So when A goes high, it's going to read input 2. Uh, give it a couple milliseconds, do the same thing for slider 1. So this update slider values is reading the value of both sliders in one shot. Now you can do up to 8 if you want. Um, we don't need to. Uh, we just need those two values. And then the final function is the draw plasma function, which is just an algorithm or a, a formula that's implemented to generate plasma and ultimately HSV values for all of the LEDs on in the background to generate this plasma time and shift uh, and create this nice elegant undulating sort of background to add some spice to the Pong game. <laughs> All right, that said, uh, that was an exhaustive, detailed overview. Hopefully that makes sense, and uh, that was useful for you to understand this implementation. Obviously, you can tweak and tune and adjust this to your heart's content. I've left a lot of uh, capabilities for you to improve it, uh, add new features or capability, uh, and I'll be sharing the, the Git repo with you so that you can, you can do that. I, I also... I did get some extra, no, that's all, that's all, that's all there is to it. Now back to future David. Now that's all the software in a nutshell. To upload this to the device, we've got the ESP, in this case 8266, 12 module selected. Um, I've set the CPU frequency to 160. This allows it to operate at a faster uh, frame rate. Everything else is the default. And for the port, we'll need to power up the device so that we'll see that over-the-air update port. And once that's complete, we can push this over. All right, so let's switch over and upload this firmware to the device. All right, to put the device into OTA mode, we just need to hold down the B button and apply power. It will boot up, and when it's ready to receive an update, you'll hear this uh, verbal announcement. All right, then back over in the Arduino IDE, we'll be able to see the Pong OTA port as part of the uh, one of the ports available to receive the firmware update. So then we can just push it over directly. That, then it's just a matter of waiting for the, the feedback in your console there to um, as the project compiles. And then once it compiles and it's ready to stream it over the port, you will see a progress indicator as it uploads the data over to the device. And then once the upload is complete, the firmware has been transmitted, then you'll hear this verbal prompt. Software update complete. And then we're good to go. It'll automatically reboot. All right, with the software complete and uploaded to the device, we're long overdue for a game demo, so let's dive into that. Ah. 
So there you go, the full stack development of this Pongcade arcade project. Now often I will ask myself, why do I go through the extents to create something that's probably been done a hundred other ways and times before me? Well, the fact is, is that through each of the phases of the development, I learn things here and there, and that's what perpetuates me sort of improving my skill sets is learning how to improve the process. And for me, that's the ECAD, you know, going through that process, seeing how other people are doing that and implementing it and do, getting the hands-on experience is really what motivates me to the next project and elevate my skills. And the, the milling, the 3D printing, all that fun stuff, all contributes to improving your skill sets. Now you can go to school and you can take lots of courses and you can become disciplined in a specific field, but if you want the hands-on experience and training that will give you practical and pragmatic knowledge in all of these different fields uh, you're going to have to put some work in to design these sort of projects to develop these sort of uh, skills and hone your skill sets so that said uh, you know ultimately in 2022 i want to make these more accessible to you full stack developments full stack projects that can sort of lead you through the process and not necessarily solve everything for you but give you a good start to understand what phases you need to consider as you go through these sort of exercises that said, I'd love to hear your feedback. Would you like to see me focus more on the video games, the handheld arcades, the milling aspects, or the full stack designs? You know, there's three different areas, but each of them are time consuming in their own right. So leave a comment below or send me direct email to david at diy.engineering. I appreciate your feedback and I'll incorporate it into the content as we move forward. That said, if you like this particular video, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate everything and it helps support the channel. Again, head down, click that link to Altium Designer. You don't have to buy it. They give you a free trial. Check it out and see what you're missing. It's a very powerful tool, and it's what I use to design all of these, these projects. In the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too.